go ahead and do. Okay, very good. All right, so uh, I'll just begin. And by, in terms of time, I will try to finish at about half an hour so we can do a QA. and um, I, the end of my presentation sort of trails off into uh, a whole bunch of different topics that we can explore. So I hope that's okay. Uh, so my name is Meng and I lead a research program at SMU. We are trying to build a DSL for law and we are hiring for CS grads. So if you would like to get paid to write open source software with a lifespan, hopefully measured in decades rather than years, uh, please email me, uh, message me on Twitter, and in the chat, I have shared the link to this presentation, so you can just fast forward if you find me boring. Um, so I'm going to start by presenting a couple of bugs, okay? The first bug is a syntax error from the year 1872. So this was a piece of law, uh, 1872, and the original text says something like fruit, plants, tropical and semi-tropical for the first appropriation, and it would be tax exempt. And at some point they added a comma between fruit and plants. And now all tropical and semi-tropical fruit would be tax exempt. And so, you know, this led to a lot of drama. People were like, oh, you know, please fix this or it's not to be fixed or whatever. And so the interesting point here is that somebody reviewing this said, you know, there's an interesting analogy between contract language and software code which is kind of the theme of this talk, right? Um, let me show you another bug from uh, just a few years ago, it's in this century, which led to a million dollar lawsuit, again, due to a comma. And so let's, let's analyze this text, okay? I will uh, put it on screen. And basically the question is, right? If I want to terminate in year two, right? Can I give one year's notice and terminate by year three? If I want to terminate in year two, can I give one year's notice and terminate by year three? Or do I have to wait until year four to give notice and then terminate in year five, right? And it all depends on this comma, because if you have the comma, then these two sort of bits of the sentence go together and then you can terminate any time because the unless and until termination applies to this whole thing. But without the comma, the unless and until only applies to this part, right? And from the point of view of a programmer, you're like, okay, this is a, a problem in like scope or binding or like operator attachment. And so, you know, as a programmer, you think if English let you use parentheses the way programmers use them, this problem would not even arise, right? Because if you had something ambiguous like this, A, B, C, and D, or E, then as a programmer, you'd be like, okay, do you mean this, or do you mean this, or do you mean this, or do you mean this? But you have to be clear and you have to specify, right? And so my claim is that in law, right, these lawsuits arise because people are like basically writing machine code by hand and lawyers just don't have a high level enough language to write their programs in, right? They're writing machine code without the benefit of things like an IDE, a type checker, linting, unit test, continuous integration, right? All of that. And if you, if you have any doubt that these drafters are actually writing something like machine code, let me show you this paragraph, which contains over a thousand words in a single sentence, right? And th this may not be the way people write law today, but there is a tradition here that you can still tell is sort of alive and well. And this is obviously something that was compiled from some kind of high level representation, right? Except the, the higher level representation only exists in the head of somebody who died a long time ago. And so for all of you who've taken a class in compilers, right? You look at this and you say, this is a problem in programming language theory, right? We need to start with something high level that can compile to this. Right. And that leads us to the question, suppose I'm a programmer, right? I'm a Python programmer, I know a bit of SQL, how would I turn law into code? Okay, and the question assumes that there is some kind of platonic essence to law, right? The meaning of the law doesn't change even if the surface representation does. So for example, if 
we have a law for speed limits under different conditions, right? Like if it's raining, the speed limit goes down. If it's sunny, then you can go a bit faster, right? That law could be represented as a picture, or it could be represented in words, in legal syntax that has evolved over centuries, right? And this is like, I asked my partner, like, who's a lawyer, like, how would you draft that as a lawyer? And she said, well, this is how I'd write it. And most people read this like, oh my God, it's like impossible to read. If you're a programmer, you'd be like, okay, why don't we just translate this into something that makes a bit more sense, right? If this is, if you want to turn it into Python, this would, how it would be in Python, right? Or JavaScript or C++, some kind of formal language, it just feels easier to understand. And you could imagine somebody saying, okay, now that I've, uh, now that I've got this law in a more sort of computational style, you would write an implementation in, you know, like Swift, if you wanted to do a mobile app, or you would do it in uh, JavaScript, if you were doing it as a web app, or you could do it in Python to serve some sort of API or whatever, right? But the problem is, if the law changes, right, the law changes all the time, then all of these implementations, you would have to go and edit each one of them to bring the logic up to date with what the law says. And so if you were a software architect, you might say, okay, this is an SST problem, right? It's a single source of truth problem. Wouldn't it be better to just have some representation that all of the different implementations could just read, right? And so the single source of truth is also known as the don't repeat yourself principle. We've kind of got like two names for the same thing, ironically. And so, you know, maybe it would be better to just start with a, an implementation independent specification syntax that allows you to just write down the meaning of the law, not in Python, not in JavaScript, but in some kind of neutral language. And here we actually just have a markdown table. And then from that, you should be able to automatically expand or run the Python or the JavaScript against something like this, right? And you can even automatically generate the English legislation from this format. And so that is the idea that lies behind a movement today that is called Rules as Code. And Rules as Code, RAC, um, is an idea that you see in governments nowadays. And they're talking about the, the possibility that regulations and legislation could be drafted in both English and machine readable format at the same time, right? Like the drafters are in the room with the programmers. And obviously it's important that both versions of the code and the English uh, should say the same thing, right? And the formal name for this is called isomorphism, <laughs> where, where you've got the code and then from that you could produce the English or you've got the English and from that you can produce the code. And it's important that these two things are in some mathematically verifiable sense identical, right? Because you don't want a situation where your code and your English say different things and then you've got this huge mess, right? And anybody who's ever experienced having the comments and the code be different, you know what I'm talking about. And so the strong form of this idea, isomorphism, says that contracts and laws could actually automatically be produced from the code. So, you know, if you were living in Quebec, you'd run the compiler once for English and then once for French. And when you have the rules in a format that a machine can read and reason over, then you can have with a machine the kind of conversation that up until now you had to pay a lawyer to have, right? And as we know, if you ask a lawyer the question, their answer will be, it depends, right? Which is fair because the world is a complicated place. And if there was an easy answer, you wouldn't have to ask the question. But now you're paying someone like $500 an hour <laughs> when what you really want to do is like right click, you know? and say, uh, I want my computer to explain it to me for free, right? So what does it depend on? And so this was kind of the motivation. And it turns out that I am not the first person to have felt this way, right? Other people who are much smarter than me have actually run with this idea to the logical extreme. And the, the whole research tradition here is basically about uh, doing a computational representation uh, doing a formalization of laws and contracts that allows you to write these things in a way that computers can understand. And there are literally dozens of academic papers, there are conferences about all this. Um, 
And while the academics were publishing papers and thinking deep thoughts, uh, the startup world sort of said, okay, well, that's all nice, uh, but we're too busy to read the papers. So we're just gonna go ahead and write some code. Here, uh, here is a VC in Silicon Valley who is explicitly looking to fund a legal tech startup to improve contract drafting. Um, and they're like, well, uh, AI is a thing that you can do, but actually we don't necessarily want to sign a contract that was drafted by GPT-3. <laughs> the, the, we want to take a slightly more symbolic approach to it rather than statistical. And so, you know, people are complaining. Like every week I see on Twitter, somebody is complaining about how legal documents are stuck in the 19th century, right? Um, and so if you think about this, right? What they're saying is that there is a lot of needless manual labor being applied to the problem when computers should be the ones doing the job. And from an economic point of view, an economist would say this is a labor versus capital situation, right? Computers are filed under capital, and then like anything requiring human attention is filed under labor. And there are a lot of entrepreneurs out there actually trying to solve these kinds of problems. There are a lot of academics who are writing papers and thinking about this. But from what I can tell, none of them have really like cracked this nut. And I suspect the reason is because the winning play has to involve actually four things at once. And you really can't rush it, right? It's, it's very hard to do this kind of thing. And if you don't get it right, <laughs> There have been these massive failures that have burned through a ton of funding. Uh, these guys like shut down last year uh, after burning like $75 million of VC funding. And when I look at this, you know, as an open source guy, I think, you know, my instinct is law is kind of the basis for our society, right? And law is too important to be left to sort of a closed source commercial approach, right? So open societies require open standards and open software, right? As Tim O'Reilly put it, the big champion of open source, you know, you should create more value than you capture. And that is what we're doing in our research program. We are trying to advance the state of the art for computer generated legalese. We are funded by the Singapore government to write open source software to represent the code that our society runs on, right? So if you think of contracts as programs and laws as kind of an operating system, we are kind of trying to build a Linux for society to run on. And one of the inspirations for this is if you think about the tools that we use as programmers, we have this whole stack of cool stuff that helps us do our jobs, right? Like we're, we're not even talking about like, like actual, like the content of programming. This is all the stuff that kind of surrounds when you write a program. And these are all the things that help you get your job done. And in law, what does the tech stack look like, right? What is the legal equivalent of this? You got, you got basically Microsoft Word is your most advanced IDE. <laughs> And track changes is your most advanced like version control technology. And that's it, right? Like in terms of programming languages, you got English, you got Latin. So, so if you look at the sort of legal tech challenge from this perspective, every gap on the right hand side is an opportunity, right? And so I'm going to show uh, how one particular idea, formal methods, is a, a really interesting thing to apply to law. Okay, so I'm going to give a quick introduction to formal methods since uh, not that many people on this call have background. So let's go back in time. In 1994, which is before many of you were born, uh, everybody was getting ready for Christmas when this post quietly arrived on Usenet from Stanford. And they said, you know, a uh, little announcement. Um, there seems to be an extraordinarily high error rate in the Pentium uh, floating point um, processor. And this turned out to be a massive bug in their CPU, their FPU. And they had to recall all the processes, which is something that you could do back then. You would open up the CPU uh, and like swing the little lever that would pop the the processor out and that 
ended up costing them $475 million because of this bug. Uh, and so that ended up actually on the list of the top 10 most costly errors, most costly software errors in history up there with like sending things to Mars that crash, right? Or um, like planes that crash. And so you can imagine the conversation inside Intel, right? They, they were like, okay, how do we not make a $475 million mistake again? Let's put a little bit of research money towards formal verification. And that is where papers like this started to come from. They said, let's formally verify our CPUs to make sure that these bugs do not exist. So don't worry, I'm, I'm not actually going to teach like a complete class in formal verification right now. I will just give you a very quick demo of how this sort of thinking works. Okay, so Ken Adams uh, is a lawyer who literally wrote the book on contract drafting. In some of those comma lawsuits, he was uh, used as an expert witness and he wrote like a 50 page paper on how commas are used in contracts. And a few years ago, he asked on Twitter the question, like, how do you characterize the difference between these two kinds of obligation, right? On the one hand, you need to keep information confidential on a sort of ongoing basis. And then on the other hand, you should pay the purchase price, but but once, you know, like you pay it once and you don't have to pay it again the next day. And here he was on Twitter and I was like, okay, dude, you're asking the wrong people, right? You're asking linguists when actually you should be asking computer scientists because we have the logic to answer this question. Let me show you how we answer the question with logic. Um, if you look at the Wikipedia page on formal verification, they will say, okay, there's this thing called LTL, there's this thing called CTL, and this is what hardware designers use to make sure that their chips don't have bugs, right? If you ship a CPU with a bug, the recall will ruin you. And that's why you have to get it right the first time. This is the kind of thing that Intel now uses. So LTL, CTL, I'm not going to go into all the details. I'll just give you a flavor of this, right? You can say, okay, this is now, this is today, this is the present, and the other circles are the future, right? So every day you follow one of these arrow edges. And so you could call this a state condition. Um, you could say there is some situation that is true today that is our state. And we develop a notation for talking precisely about future states, right? This is tomorrow. So if you say for all possible tomorrows, this is the next state and we'll use it to describe this, the syntax is AX, right? And so there's a whole series of different uh, little prefixes that you can use to say there ex exists at least one state tomorrow in which something is true, or for all states in all possible futures something is true, or there at least there exists at least one path in which something is true. So you know you can see there's this whole vocabulary for talking about these things, and this actually corresponds to the kinds of ideas that show up in contracts all the time, right? Um, and so this gives you a a syntax, a logic, a semantics, a calculus for talking about time and things that are true or false over time. And these are exactly the tools we need to answer the original question, right? Um, so the question is like, Acme shall keep the information confidential forever versus at some point in the future, Acme shall pay the purchase price, right? And so the answer, I'll just give you the answer is, AG, right, Acme shall always keep the information confidential, looks like this, and Acme shall pay the purchase price eventually, but only pay it once, looks like AF. Does that make sense? So, so you can apply this kind of thinking to contracts in law, and it turns out that uh, more than 10 years ago, there were a couple of people who said, why don't we apply these ideas of model checking to contracts? So you know, if you take a standard like SLA contract that you might sign if you're a, a big ISP. The ISP says, okay, if your traffic goes too high, then you have to pay if it, and so on. And so they said, why don't we just take this contract and translate it into the kind of LTL, CTL kind of logic that we just showed you with slightly different uh, mathematical symbols here. But line by line, you can translate this into a formal notation that is in some sense, machine readable. And then you can pass it to the machine and you can say, you know, does the contract contain any bugs? Are there any loopholes? 
And the machine will say, okay, I'm going to drop it into graphviz and show you the possible state transitions of this contract. And I will show you a particular bug that leads to a violation of something that you care about, right? And this happens automatically using tools like Upal, TLA plus, Alloy that you can learn about. And this is basically, then, then it says, and now you have to go fix this bug, right? And this kind of um, approach is how you can debug a contract the same way that a software engineer debugs a program, right? In the same way that a hardware engineer debugs a chip. And I think this is really interesting because this begins to encroach on the kinds of things that lawyers get paid the big bucks to do, right? Like you're sort of thinking through the scenarios, you're thinking, you're trying to find a potential problem, you come up with a solution. And you can do this with like SLAs, financial contracts, regulatory situations, any kind of contract. And that is, um, that is a really interesting future where the machines are able to start doing what the lawyers used to be the only people who could do, right? This kind of thing. So, so like these technologies that we're developing, like every technology can be used for good or for evil. Um, <laughs> tax avoidance, for example, is something that a lot of people put a lot of mental energy into. And a few years ago, a paper came out which applied formal methods to the problem of detecting tax loopholes. And so it turns out that there's a particular transaction that the, like, has to do with like companies that have international branches and they move money around from one branch to the other to pay less tax. And it was interesting to, to see this, right? I'm not gonna ask you to read this right now, but the challenge was like, how do we move profits around so that we pay the least tax possible? which actually kind of sounds like a graph traversal problem, right? And so the insight is, uh, if you happen to be a company that uh, can build a machine that can beat humans at chess, then you also have the ability to build software that can beat the tax authorities at income. So that's, that's you know, one thing that kind of happens. Um, another example from the world of tax is, suppose you say, okay, here's the, here's the tax code that applies to humans. Um, let's research this and find out, are there any scenarios where uh, if my salary goes up, like I get a raise at work, paradoxically, my effective take-home pay actually goes down, right? And if you are a computer scientist, you are thinking about this as, oh, this is a, a monotonicity problem, right? If your, if your salary goes up, then your take-home pay should also go up monotonically. And it turns out that you can use uh, formal methods to answer this question. And just, uh, just a few months ago, um, a researcher in France said, let's formulate uh, the entire French tax code and just start like fuzzing it with different possible inputs to see if this scenario could actually arise. And he found a case where if you make like 500 euros more, uh, 480 euros more, then a whole bunch of other things get computed. And it turns out that you no longer qualify for certain like child scholarship um, eligibility, and then you end up making less money. So it was interesting because he, he was able to basically grind through all the taxes and find scenarios where this monotonicity constraint was violated. And uh, people have talked about how to do this in Python, for example. And so you can run this as a test, right? You can say a raise in salary should never cause a loss. And then you run that through as, a, as part of your test suite, as an assertion. So this is the sort of thing that is actually really hard for humans to find, but which computational law makes possible. So you, know, you can ap apply this kind of thinking to laws, to contracts, all kinds of legal scenarios where things get complex very fast. So... Um, this is an active area of research, and it is a pretty exciting time to be doing this because we get to take advantage of all kinds of tech that is just now coming online. Like, for example, this is an open standard uh, legal rule ML that like, came out less than a year ago, and they are trying to provide a formal semantics for law, which is uh, really interesting uh, because, as we know, law legal text is the ultimate pseudocode, right? It is a 
a self-modifying specification language that can make arbitrary system calls to the real world, right? So anyway, I did promise a, a demo of what we're doing. So in the time remaining, I will talk about our language, which is called L4. And in our, in the example that I'll give, we'll talk about cabbage, right? Because there's this joke about cabbage. And so let's pretend there's a scenario, there's a cabbage law that says, you know, you can only sell cabbage when there is a full moon, unless obviously you have some kind of exemption granted by somebody. Um, and if there was a cabbage transaction, then buyers will have the right within three weeks to return their cabbage for a refund, 90% refund, and the seller must issue the refund within three days of the return. Right. So the question is, how do we isomorphically formalize this into some language which can be read by a computer, right? And once it's in the computer, you want to be able to compile it back to English, and then you can also do all kinds of other useful things with it. So our first draft of solving this, this particular problem kind of looks like this. Um, it will probably look better in future you may be able to detect that this is slightly inspired by SQL, SQL, right? Like if you're doing databases, you're using SQL. And we would like to say, if you are doing law, you will use our language, L4. And so this is machine readable source code. There is a language specification that defines the semantics. There's a parser and we're writing adapters to connect to other software. And the language is only a few months old, so you can expect it to evolve. But basically, this is meant to be like reasonably readable by someone who is not necessarily a full-time programmer. You know, like typically a law exists, a contract already exists. And if you want to tweak a contract, you go in there and you're like, okay, I just want to change this one thing. And so this language is designed and optimized to allow people to jump in and make a single tweak relatively simply like for example if the definition of a cabbage changes right and there's like a third species of cabbage that is now considered a cabbage like we want people to be able to say okay i think i know i need to just add a line add a comma and add the thing right and so this this language is kind of the current version of what we've got the language spec um, sort of looks like this i i won't get into it but it is very much inspired by sql in terms of like making it easy for business users to try to write simple declarative um, like specifications that can then run against uh, some mechanical backend. SQL is based on the relational algebra. Our system is based on the modal calculus for deontic and temporal expressions. Um, and our claim is that the general form of any clause in any contract obeys this structure, right? And this is what legal rule in L calls a prescriptive rule. Um, basically, every contract is just made up of a graph of these kinds of clauses that say, under some condition, a certain party who meets certain criteria either must, may, or shall not perform some action that meets certain criteria before some deadline or after some deadline, right? And every clause in a contract basically has this format. And if the party does do this, then like the control flow goes to another clause. But if they fail to do this, then control flow goes to a different clause, X and Y. And you can think of every contract as a giant graph of these kinds of clauses. That's it, basically, right? Um, laws contain a lot of texts that say like certain criteria are met if any of these conditions are met or all of these subconditions are met. And so we want to provide a syntax for people to say this kind of thing in a way that is unambiguous. Um, we're gonna like we're fooling around with different kinds of like syntactic sugar to say this. And so I think we are the first language to ever have like element, element, comma, comma, and then an or right at the end. So this is the or, and this is the and. I don't know if the syntax will survive, but the goal is to solve the kinds of ambiguities where you're like, okay, you know, if this, if you walk into a restaurant and the set lunch menu is like, you can order ribeye steak and French fries or Caesar salad, then you're like, okay, so like what exactly <laughs> is the menu, right? Am I supposed to just order a Caesar salad and get that? Or do I get ribeye steak 
and Caesar salad or ribeye steak and french fries. So these are the kinds of ambiguities that we talked about previously, right? And we want to be able to develop a language, an IDE, a whole compiler tool chain that helps people avoid these kinds of errors, avoid these kinds of lawsuits, and help end users actually have a better idea like what the law says, what the contract says, what happens in this scenario without having to consult a lawyer. So this is just sort of scratching the surface of what, um, what we want to do with the language. Uh, we've talked about formal verification. We've talked about how you can automatically generate like a Python or JavaScript app from the higher level specification. Uh, we talked a little bit about how we plan to generate English output, but you could also say, okay, we're going to, going to generate English and Chinese and like Bahasa Indonesia. And you have the confidence that all of these natural language things actually say the same thing, right? Because they all compiled from a higher level source. Uh, there are like, you can do things like scenario planning, like how do I get from here to there? You can do unit testing and you can say, you know, show it to me as a flowchart of like, like how does this contract work? Am I allowed to pay this much? What happens if I don't pay? You know, like who, which party has to do what? So doing these kinds of visualizations are, are a very helpful way to help users understand contracts. So I don't want to like, take up too much time getting into all this theory, but if you are a computer scientist, you will recognize some of these ideas. Um, we are like writing extensions to VS Code so that you can actually like write your thing in VS Code and have things like highlighting and hover and completion. And like, we will return syntax errors like this clause conflicts with that clause. You know, like, under this condition, you're supposed to sell this thing, but under that condition, you're supposed to sell to somebody else. So all of these things are part of our plan for how to make this thing useful to people in the real world. And I just want to point out one thing, which is that the intended user for this is not necessarily the lawyer working in a law firm. It is the sort of the end user, the consumer or the small business, somebody who's working in a company who has to get some sort of legal thing done but doesn't want to go out and like actually hire a law firm to do it. And so they want to just like download an app, right? Or use some service that lets them do it basically for free. And that is one of the goals of our software stack is to enable these people to get away without paying thousands of dollars to a lawyer. And, and that sort of brings me full circle to the reason I got into this in the first place. <laughs> which was that I was just astonished by how little technology was being used by my lawyers. And I started thinking, maybe I could do this without lawyers at all, or at least just have the lawyers involved at the very, very like, like value added part of it, but not the more boring mundane stuff that a machine should do and could do if all of this technology existed. So that's my talk. I am happy to take questions in the chat or by voice. Um, I've posted the link to the slides in the chat. So you're welcome to just have a look through this stuff. Uh, happy to dive into anything. The first question that we have is, well, we've got a couple of questions. One is like, what is the state of the art for computer generated legalese? So I will just address that very, very quickly. Um, I would answer that question by looking at things like um, Attempto controlled English is one interesting example. So these things are called controlled natural languages. A CNL is a subset of English with a restricted syntax and semantics that are described, written down formally somewhere. And while it appears to be English, it is actually a formal language. So you've got things like existential quantifiers, universal quantifiers. Um, you've got logical implication, right? So all of these things um, can be then converted into some kind of formal representation that has asymantics. Um, but this is basically a, an academic project and it hasn't been productized in a form that people like you and me can use uh, without having to like, go do a PhD in this. 
So the next question is, what are your thoughts on AI law tech companies? Um, they're trying to mix some statistics until things look like they make sense. And yeah, I, I have this whole rant about how um, this sort of statistical approach to legal analytics is, I think, very challenged <laughs> by the fact that, you know, of all the fields that you would want to apply this to, right? Like if you were applying like GPT-3 to poetry or novels, you'd be like, okay, you know, in Xanadu did Kublai Khan, right? Um, if a poem was cut off halfway, maybe you can use AI to write the other half of the poem, right? Like if there was a symphony that was left unfinished, maybe you can use AI to finish the symphony. But if I'm trying to do like textual extraction from a contract, I don't think the software is, is strong enough. Because if you look at tools, like if you look at, I mean, all these things use the same underlying toolkit, right? They, they use things like NLTK. And a package like NLTK, the first thing that it will do is it will throw away the punctuation. Right? It will throw away the commas. <laughs> and as we've seen, if you throw away the commas, you end up with lawsuits. So I, I honestly don't think this is the, the kind of the solution that you want. Um, the, the system that we are using is called grammatical framework. And that is, there's no sort of statistical AI in the sense of like machine learning, neural net, deep learning. You know, this stuff is all completely old fashioned symbolic AI. Um, and we use this to do our natural language generation. We stay away from trying to process and turn English into code. We think it is safer to turn code into English. Um, and so we're, we don't want to get into the field of like trying to read a bunch of text and understanding what it means. Because as long as that kind of understanding is measured in percentages, then it's not good enough. Um, a few years ago, there was a sort of famous showdown that happened where they were like, you know, if you want to review a bunch of contracts, uh, in, in this case, it was a bunch of NDAs. Um, they said, we get an average of like 94% accuracy, whereas the lawyers only get like 85% accuracy. But frankly, you know, like this is a sort of situation where like either it's 100% or it's not good enough. <laughs> so, so like our approach is pretty formalist and we think we can get to 100 because we're writing the code at the same time that we're writing the English. So the next question, um, how does this DSL fit with judgments issued by courts, right? It makes a lot of sense for legislation, but it doesn't seem so straightforward for case law. And that is an excellent point. Um, the, the sort of legal system that we happen to live under is the common law system where legislation ultimately is interpreted by the courts and like the law may say something, but if a judge has said, well, we have that law mean a little bit different from what it says, then you have to go and follow what the judge said. Um, and so we are pretty early in this project and we are trying to do the formalization of the laws, but I think maybe in the future, we'll be able to tackle the case law aspect of it. But right now we're trying to stick to like pretty black and white stuff, like corporate stuff, tax stuff. You know, if we ever get into things like criminal law, um, where there's a lot more gray area, then maybe we'll have something more probabilistic. So I can tell you that a friend of mine is a judge. And when I talked about this with him, he said, you know, this is actually really interesting because as a judge, when we do sentencing, you know, we actually want there to be some decent sentencing guidelines because you feel really uncomfortable as a judge if you find out that like you sentenced some criminal last week to a particular penalty and then your colleagues all sentenced similar criminals to a completely different kind of penalty. You know, it's like, oh, am I being exceptionally harsh 
or am I being exceptionally lenient? What am I doing wrong? You know, how would I actually fit in with my peers? So even judicial discretion uh, wants to be standardized. So the next question is, if the work is open source, what is the business model? And I think that, uh, you know, this is an excellent question. There are a lot of people who have different opinions about how to commercialize open source. Um, but there are a lot of open source business models out there. Like you could say, look at Adobe, right? Like Adobe is this massive company, um, but they have no problem selling commercial software, even though their very first uh, product you know, was an open source. Today it is an open source-ish language, right? Adobe's first product was not Photoshop. Uh, Adobe's first product was PostScript. And without PostScript, there would be no PDF. And without PDF, there would be no like Illustrator, InDesign. And yet, you know, having that open standard foundation doesn't keep them from being like a $200 billion company, right? Uh, even though PDF is open, everybody uses it, it is still quite strongly associated with Adobe. And if I want to like do manipulation of PDF or like document signatures, you know, Adobe finds ways to still sell you software that deals with an open standard. Um, so next question is, how long do you think it will take for widespread standardization and adoption by lawmakers, et cetera? And how will you go about achieving this? Um, so excellent question. Again, th these are things that actually keep me up at night because I don't always have a strong answer for that. My intuition uh, is that there are so many people complaining about how the state of the art sucks um, that probably there will be some latent demand and people will begin to use this. Now, who are the people who will begin to use this? They are going to be the sort of technically minded individuals like you and me. If you, you know, like take your programming skills into the working world and you encounter some kind of legal problem, some sort of legal situation, your first instinct is, is there an app for that? Is there something I can NPM I, right? Is there something I can pip install? And at that point, that's where we will come in and we will say, yes, we can help you with, you know, the legal situation that you're facing, hopefully. And maybe uh, all the tools that you need to do it are going to be free. Maybe after a while, you're like, okay, I'm going to try and get this solution deployed within my company but the people in my company are not as technical as I am. So they're actually willing to pay for something that will give them training or support or like premium products. We were joking that maybe the solution is like, we will generate all your documents, but we will do it in Comic Sans. <laughs> and if you want it in Helvetica, then you have to pay extra. So I don't know, like the, these are all like, there are a lot of different possible uh, ways to build solid business models on open platforms and open standards and open source. And it is interesting to see that like out of nowhere, people like this dude, like he's a lawyer and he says he hates his tools, but he's also a programmer and he loves his programming tools. So if we can find a way to sort of cross these beams, I think there is a lot of potential. Um, it is not necessarily the non-technical lawyer, right? If you're a non-technical lawyer, you're not using these tools. If you're a technical person trying to solve a legal problem, then you're gonna use these tools, right? We're not trying to sell the stuff to law firms. Um, next country, would the DSL be tied to the context of a particular country's law or would it eventually be general enough to be general for ubiquitous use in any country? And the answer is basically, yeah. I mean, uh, if you think of a country's legal system as kind of like a library that you can import, then, like people want to do the same things uh, no matter what country they're in, right? Like they want to go out, start a company, they want to raise funding, they want to like do an MA or they want to do like a service contract, a sale contract, rental contract, employment contract. All of that happens against the backdrop of whatever host OS you're running on, but you can run 
you know, you can run Firefox on Windows, you can run Firefox on Mac, you can run it on Linux. And so from our point of view, the law is the OS and a contract that needs to interface with the law may sort of compile against all the system calls available. It may import the jurisdiction as a library. Uh, and if you are changing the jurisdiction that you're operating in, then you just change the line at the top of the program that says import whatever, import Singapore law, import Hong Kong law. All right, so that is exactly the way we think about it. What are the potential obstacles, uh, technical and non-technical, that you foresee in the development and eventual adoption of such a solution? Well, I don't know. Like the, the interesting thing about all this, um, you know, we are inspired by the idea that software is eating the world. This is something that Mark Andreessen said. Um, they came out with this thesis 10 years ago and they have done very, very well since. Um, and the interesting idea about when software eats the world, if I can quote William Gibson, um, the street finds its own uses for things, right? And the sort of formal academic way of saying this is that um, really interesting software is generative. You don't actually know what people are going to do with something like an open standard or a piece of open source software until it's sort of out there and widely adopted. So Jonathan Zittrain calls this idea generativity. And in our scenario applied to us, I think the interesting thing is not so much what you know, we can transfer over from existing ways of doing things. It's gonna be more about what are the things that, that we can't anticipate today. So there was a discussion going on uh, uh, like a couple of days ago. So I'm going to scroll past all of my weird discussion and look at a, a chat that this guy, uh, Thomas Officer, strangely enough, he was having a discussion about what does the future of legal services look like? You know, today legal services are services like dental services are services like you open your mouth and some qualified person sticks a tool in it right and if that qualified person decides to go on holiday they don't get paid and you don't get dental so the question is how do you productize right this kind of service in such a way that the machine can deliver it and the dentist can go on holiday and you don't have to worry right you can still get your dental needs met and so you know thomas officer this guy who's the founder of some legal tech startup talked about how software eats the world and his big idea is that the generativity is the really interesting piece. There is the ability to create services that couldn't be delivered traditionally. You know, the first stage you go and you sort of transfer offline to online. And then the second stage is to create entirely new things. And so he is excited about that possibility in the future, but what form it will actually take, I don't know. So that's my talk. I hope that was useful. I am going to stop sharing my screen since my girlfriend is messaging me a lot. Um, I'm happy to take any more questions, but I think we are out of time. It is time to take our five minute break. Would uh, our host like to say anything? Yeah, so uh, if anyone has any more questions, uh, Ming, would you be open to um, maybe emailing you or something? Yeah, please email me. I will type my email address into the chat. And on Twitter, it is Ming Wong. And we are hiring. So uh, if you would like to do something with your very technical skills, other than like write shopping carts for people, um, please come and do something a bit more like meaningful. <laughs> Sorry, that might be a bit rude. <laughs> like, there's nothing wrong with shopping carts. Without shopping carts, I wouldn't have a lot of the things that I have in my house. But um, but like this is this is meant to like apply deep tech like programming theory, form verification theory, like real computer science, and not just like you know endless React debugging, you know. So like consider coming out here and working for us. Yeah. So usually I ask the speakers if they stay a little to answer more questions, but Ming has an appointment tonight. So yeah, if any questions, you probably can direct him 
that is email or Twitter. So, uh, yeah, that's about it. Uh, Ming, for we'll we'll update you with the recordings and whatnot. Uh, sometime tonight, hopefully. Yeah, and I believe that's all on our side. So thank you very much again for the all right. talk. Thank yeah, you so I much. Hope everyone enjoyed. Enjoy your Google Talk. Goodbye. Okay, so for everyone else, uh, maybe uh, I see the next speaker, Vincent's already here. Hi, Vincent. Uh, maybe we'll take a four minute break this time. Yeah. Uh, in the meantime, yeah. So, yeah, get us freshen yourselves up and uh, we will. We'll we'll start Vincent's talk at eight o three maybe. Yeah. So see everyone at around eight o three. Hello, I hope everyone can hear me. Hi, Vincent. Hi, Vincent. Yep. Hi, uh, we'll be, uh, We are having a short five minute, four minute break now. Uh, after the audience to come back around 8.03. Sure, sounds good. Um, sh uh, should I present in the meantime? Um, yeah, sorry about that. So um, so what we could typically do is uh, we introduce the speaker uh, with a couple of sides and then we, um, we'll let you have the floor. So yeah, so at around 8.05, uh, Ching will introduce you and then uh, then we can have the talk. Yeah. So at that point, we'll let you share screen. That's fine. Mm -hmm. So actually, I'm curious, uh, Vincent, uh, what's... Uh, I was curious why you chose uh, ML and ML ops for uh, today's talk. Is it is it the thing that excites you the most of, at at Google? Um, yeah, actually, for the very simple reasons, it's because what I do on a daily basis, uh, most of the times. But yeah, definitely, I'm going to share more about uh, about my experience at Google and why I exactly do. But um, yeah, this will be a very intro. Um, I I plan it to be very intro so that like it includes everyone's that just learn about programming or maybe like ML 
and so on. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, students here just got done with midterms. I guess they're looking forward to something fresh um, as we head towards yeah. the second half of the semester. Yeah. So thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, just curious. Um, are you talking to us from Indonesia? Uh, yes, I'm in Jakarta now. All right. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, we, we've been having uh, quite a series of uh, International Friday hacks. So uh, uh, three weeks ago, we had a talk by William Bird and Jason Heyman, and they uh, were zooming in with us from Alabama in the United States. Um, and then nice. today we have you. And uh, yeah, I think even next week we're having an international talk. With that. Thank you so much for uh, taking time out of your schedule for this. Yeah. No problem. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Yeah. Um, so how we typically run the session is, is this. Uh, so the speaker uh, typically speaks for around uh, 30 to 45 minutes. And uh, during the session, uh, people put on the questions in the chat. Uh, and then you can choose to address them during the talk or at the end. Um, and at the end, we'll have a QA and a as well, like a, a short one, uh, until, it's, until we run out of time, basically. So I was curious uh, whether you're OK with people interrupting you in the middle of the talk if you have an urgent question. Uh, yeah, feel free to interrupt me in the middle of my talk. Okay. It would be great if, uh, if there are questions, then, then I know it's like um, what other people think or maybe what they are interested in. So yeah, feel free to do that. All right, great, okay. yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's around 8 of 4. Uh, Chingen, you want to take over? Yeah, sure. All right, so let's see. We have 36 people. OK. I hope everyone's back. Uh, if not, I'll start with the introduction. Yeah, so welcome back, everyone. Uh, hi again, Vincent. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> uh, allow me to introduce Vincent formally. So. Uh, he works at the trust and safety team at Google. So today he'll be sharing about how Google uses machine learning to detect spam and also deploy this at a massive scale with billion devices. So uh, as Mayang mentioned earlier, most of you have had midterms. I know some of you still have a final paper tomorrow probably. So, so sorry for the rest of you. <laughs> but uh, in case your midterms are already done and your brain is fried, uh, Vincent has promised to keep today's talk more accessible so you don't have to worry about having more equations to <laughs> stare at and yeah oh sorry i didn't mean to show that uh i'll be using control to vincent to share his slides now yeah uh vincent? okay sure yep let me share my screen quickly all right i think i'm sharing my screen now so i assume i am all right so um yeah good evening everyone yeah i'll just make it very, very, uh, very, very like, and just like mentioned by Jinyan and uh, my young as well that, yeah, let's, let's just keep this like two ways conversation. So feel free to, uh, feel free to, yeah, just ask me questions as I move along, right? So the, the reasons why I'm talking about machine learning and ML ops today is because that this is something that's near to uh, what I do at Google every day. And um, this, I intend it to be like, very basic, but since um, since like uh, most of you like come from a probably like IT background, so I'll just like skim through the machine learning parts and maybe like go through uh, the ML ops more more often. But feel free to always like stop me like whenever uh, whenever you feel lost or whenever I I speak too fast. Okay, with that, um, thank you so much for coming um, at eight uh, eight p.m. And so let's get started. So first of all, yep, let me introduce about who I am, right? So my name is Vincent. So I'm machine learning engineer and analyst at Google Trust and Safety. And if you if you're still wondering, hmm, so I so I look into these guys, like why why this guy is like uh, talking here right now. Feel free to take a look into like Medium, LinkedIn, and Beta podcast. Um, that sort of like highlights uh, all the summaries and and my my career journey, right? Um, previously and now. And just a little bit of a disclaimer so that uh, I'm not getting laid off tonight. Is that, yeah, so this, um, this presentation is purely my own like personal thoughts and personal views. So yeah, feel free to ask me. And this is no in any, 
hidden agenda like from Google and from different companies. So this is a little bit about my path to Google. So um, I, I graduated from SMU Management Information System and Services, uh, July 2017. Uh, previously, I entered at Lazada and I work at FISA as a data architecture engineer. And currently, uh, since 2019, I work at Google. So what do I do at Google exactly? Um, it's actually very simple to prevent phishing at scale with data analytics and machine learning. Okay, so what do I really do at Google? Well, what I do is that I'm I'm protecting uh, web abusers, right? I'm I'm protecting the users against web abusers, and what how I do that is that I do a bunch of like geeky detective works, a bunch of analyst works, and also do a bunch of like ML engineering works so that I can actually catch the bad guys uh, to protect you um, online automatically. And if you don't know what I'm I'm really talking about, maybe you you will be more familiar with these like red interstitial warnings, right? So if you take a look at this red interstitial warnings, what it says is basically it's, it's saying like, you shall not pass, right? It's like Gandalf, right? You shall not pass. And basically, uh, if you still pass because you want to like download your like torrents or whatever, then uh, basically you're on your own, right? But this is the responsibilities that I have is that to make sure that no one is trying to, um, no one is trying to scam you, no one is trying to fish you. Because um, in the pandemics, we all know very often, like in the news, Straits Times, everyone talks about like how many phishing scams and um, whatsoever. Right? People are getting very, very desperate with their financial situations. And uh, we also see a huge numbers of like investment scams related to cryptocurrencies. And it's, it's saddened me because um, there are a lot of like younger and older generations, vulnerable populations that get scammed and lose their retirement funds. right? So if you see these red warnings, then make sure you beware, right? Don't enter this. Okay. So what do I do mostly, right? So uh, to make sure that there's a red warning decision, so basically it's a spam and ham problem. And to make sure that I identify the spam over the ham is that I look into a bunch of like signals, right? Oh, yeah, this is the one. Um, yeah, so the first, the very first thing is that I will look into some escalations. So maybe from Singapore uh, government body or maybe like other government institutions, uh, they will come to us and then say, hey, uh, we have we have seen some some people get fished. Uh, can you please help us to look into it? Right. So we do all the geeky detective work. We, are, we have all the tools that are needed for us to take a look into uh, some of the features um, that those like sites have our targets. And after that, we react to it accordingly, right? And then we protect our uh, everyone that actually assesses that particular site. And of course, uh, over the time when you get escalations, then you kind of realize that, hey, there's a pattern, right? There's a certain pattern throughout. Um, for example, like recently in the pandemic, people are talking about investments a lot. Um, so maybe like there are some related to investments. And uh, of course, maybe towards like health, related like vaccinations and so on, right? So all of these are like all known issues. And in the newspaper, we always see like, um, they, they talk to us like, for example, there's there are recent facing cases of like vaccination scams, right? To try to steal your credit card accounts and so on. And that happens very often. So policy making is identifying these patterns and then like come up with a way in order to scale, scale up the uh, abuse protections. And of course, finally, the fun part, and I think uh, what most of us learn in the university is the ML and um, deep neural network, right? Deep learning. So of course, by the end of the day, um, there's limitations to how we can take a look into the data and escalations. So what do we do is that we want to make sure that we scale it up, right? And we use a bunch of machine learning tools, maybe like within NLPs, within computer visions, to make sure that we are catching the bad guys, right? So this is automations, and of course, it goes back to escalations. People, uh, maybe the attackers are getting smarter, and then like the defender, the us to defend our users, uh, Chrome, Android, and uh, Chrome, Android, and Gmail. Like we need to be smarter as well, right? So it's always like cats and dogs fights, and we always need to uh, go through the loops over and over again. 
So every day is a new task, right? It's, it's not like only one of these things, but it's just a lot of things together, right? And every day is a different day for me, right? Yeah, in fact, this is like my life at Google. So uh, most of the times I do like focus works, like many I'm reading, newspaper, uh, reading paper and uh, trying to come up with some POCs, do a bunch, this up a bunch of like collapse and maybe like design docs in order to come up with ways um, to feature engineers and ways to uh, devise a model, evaluate the model, identify the ground truth and so on, right? So it's always an iterative work and focus work um, that takes part of my, the majority of my time. But of course, uh, we also have like meetings, right? Uh, meetings are a lot uh, because the thing about like phishing protections and web abuse is that there are so many stakeholders involved, right? Not only the clients, but also inside. Um, there are also like security uh, compliance and there are so many things, right? I just give it very general um, just to make sure that we get a very brief understanding about it. Okay, before I move on to uh, maybe like machine learning and ML ops. Are there like any questions so far? Cool. Um, I assume not, but yeah, I will. I will try to come up with uh, a few more minutes uh, by the end of these presentations for questions. So, what is data science and machine learning? I believe everyone knows about it, and everyone has like different uh, perspective about it. And this is one of them, right? Machine learning is a computational method using experience to improve performance. And in other words, if I want to summarize it, it's a bunch of uh, multidisciplinary kinds of like approaches, right? Like you have computers and you have data and you have objective, right? So computers, we we all familiar it with it, like Friday hacks, for example, like we always hack stuff, right? Algorithm, complexity analysis, big or notations, theoretical quarantines, all of those are, uh, are something that computers can help. Data analysis will be statistics and probability and objective to understand to understand the problem simulations, evaluations, et cetera. So this is actually a fun fact, and I think uh, most of you are quite familiar. <laughs> when we talk about machine learning to our mom, <laughs> what will our mom say, right? <laughs> and our mom say like, what, what, what is machine learning? Uh, machine learning is probably, you know, like credit card, like um, you just like tap money and then like you can shop online. It's so basically what that machine learning does, right? According to what my mom says. But of course, machine learning is a bunch of stuff, right? But by the end of the day, what I really do is uh, quite accurate in the sense that we look into the charts a lot. We just list out models, um, maybe like five or six or 10 models, right? And then we just compare which model that sort of like performed the best, right? Given a certain ground truth. And if it's good, then we iterate. We keep iterating it. Uh, we keep coming up with new ground truth uh, or maybe like patterns analysis. Then after that, yep, this is the kind of impacts that we have, right? And of course, the real world impacts uh, will be will be a lot. So the first one is the teachable machine. Um, if you want to take a look into like computer visions, uh, feel free to play around. There are so many like uh, playground that you can uh, train it directly there. Yep. And this is uh, regarding IoT. So you, um, apparently, there's a uh, if you like beef, right? Um, then there are there are a lot of farms in New Zealand that are actually using this Internet of Things uh, tagging. Right, in order to identify whether the cows are healthy and sick or sick. And strip views as well uh, to identify all these object detections. And finally, Google Translates, right? We always take a look into like how NLP is very, very important and how basically we can um, we can translate a language on Google. Okay. So this is a very important um, problem. Um, regarding ML pipeline. And unfortunately, in many different kinds of scenarios, um, we are very trained with Kegel mentality in the sense that all the problems are given to us, right? In Kegel, you know like how, what you are evaluated against, uh, you know like what you are competing uh, for, like you know what are the metrics, right? But unfortunately, in real life world, um, outside universities and outside Kegel is that the problems are most of the times uh, very, very fact, right? 
um, it's very unclear. And if you don't understand about how you can formulate the problems to suit your stakeholder needs, then what the, by the end of the day, um, you will lose out a lot of precious time. So the very first thing uh, if in ML pipeline is always talking about framing the problem. If you see the picture here, um, as it just a quick question, like who knows what this picture represents? It's a, it's a Chinese, Chinese story. Oh, I think somebody asked a question. Okay, uh, Wong Meng, uh, sorry, I, Meng Wang, right? Uh, apologize if I'm not answering correctly. So how are relevant are technologies like SPF and DKIM in modern entice phishing or anti spam methods? Um, okay. I'm not sure about SPF and DKIM. Can maybe like somebody uh, explain to me more about what this stand for? Because SPF for me, like in web abuse, like Singapore Police Force, right? But um, maybe like if you can explain to me more. <clears throat> oh, okay. So domain case, uh, DKIM is domain keys identified mail, right? Mm, honestly, I think this is a quite different. Uh, I think you're talking about um, crypto cryptography. And for me, uh, I'm not the right person to talk about it because I don't deal with cryptography. I deal mostly with like identifying spam or hand in phishing detection problems, right? So if you are interested, I can find out more about it and maybe I can talk to you um, separately. Okay, I hope that's clear. Um, okay, so uh, this story um, is about playing a harp uh, to a cow, right? Or playing flute to a cow. So if the story goes like this, right? Like um, there's this one musician that's called like uh, Kou Ming. So Kou Ming is a very, um, is a very talented like musician. Everyone is dying to have him play for him or her, right? Even the king will pay like a whole lot of like um, um, of assets, right? In order to in order to make sure that he plays for him, right? So at one point of time, uh, Kou Ming, because it's of his fame, uh, he he got very bored with city life, right? Uh, maybe like most of us do in pandemics, but he got bored of city life. So what he does is that he walk around the countryside and then he's, he's, he sits down, he sits down and he sees a cow, right? He sees a bull eating the grass in front of him, right? So Paul Min talked to himself, right? Hey, maybe I could pay for, play for this cow, right? So he played a lot of techniques. He, uh, he played very nice, very tune tune one until like everyone is like really wow, right? Um, like those like techniques that you have like 10, 10 hands at the same time, right? Um, to solve like do the finger styling. But uh, it doesn't work for this cow. The cow just keeps eating and eating. So Kumin tried to adapt to um, adapt to whatever technique that he knows, but to no avail, right? But by the, end of the day, by the end of the day, he tried to take a look into the cow, and then, and then he got an idea, right? He got an idea, maybe like I could, uh, he played very simple, right? Like ting, 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 very simple. But it mimics a, uh, it, it mimics a uh, cow's cough voice, cow sound, right? Like ting, 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 like very simple. But because of that, uh, the cow is is paying attention to him and now listening to him playing. And I think this is the case that we uh, we understand today in the uh, business context is that most of the times, like what we learned um, at school, um, all the different kind of techniques, it's very very important, but it's not everything, right? Um, it's not the foundations of the value that you are bringing to your stakeholders. And like how um, Kuming play uh, his harp to to the cow, we also need to make sure that we understand who our audience is, right? and what they care about. How you communicate to product manager and how you communicate to your fellow engineers or maybe how you communicate to your, uh, to your business analysts might be different, right? Because they have a different interest. And sometimes uh, interpretability is very, very important compared to uh, complexity and accuracy, right? So always remember these three things. What is your goal? Who are your stakeholders? And how do you add value to them? 
And if not, this is what's going to happen to you. So I usually talk about MLOps a lot and MLOps deal with a bunch of like problem framings and monitoring uh, to deliver values. But if you don't take a look at problem framing uh, clearly, then what happened is like uh, this Netflix case. Netflix never used its 1 million algorithm due to engineering costs. So apparently it's too, uh, the solution is accurately, um, it's very, very accurate. It, it's it's uh, increasing the recommendation engine by 10%, but no one is using it, right? Um, it's just a flunk because the engineering team suddenly realized that, hey, we cannot support this, it's too slow. So this is something that you need to take a look at. Okay, so this is ML pipeline. Uh, very, very quick about it, since I think most of you are very familiar. So the first one is data collections. Uh, some things that you need to know is that more data beats smaller algorithm, but to the point that there's a diminishing returns. So when you see these diminishing returns, more of the time is that you need to solve a comfort to, uh, to more complex uh, models, right? Or maybe you can try with transfer learning, right? Because most of the time we don't really need to create the model on our own, right? We can just like use whatever that's already existing in this TensorFlow hub. Okay, so big data might be overkill, and it really, really depends on the problems that you are uh, looking to. And model training, we all know about regressions and classifications, and each of the algorithm has multiple characteristics. So. Uh, every time you have like data science interviews, they will definitely ask you something like this. For example, why did you use like uh, decision tree over SVM, for example, or over like, logistic regressions? Um, they, will, they will ask you like why um, you should think about a model A compared to model B, what kind of assumptions there are, right? And some assumptions would be like how susceptible they are to outliers, right? For example, decision tree is not that susceptible to outliers because it's rule-based determinations, right? No matter like outli what outliers you have, by the end of the day, it's like one data point, right? In, in the middle of like two dimensions or like n dimensions scatter plot, for example. But of course, if you're talking about regressions, then it's very susceptible to outliers, right? Imagine like income, and then you suddenly have Bill Gates in the middle of like uh, Singaporean populations. Then of course, the regressions will just like uh, go haywire, right? Okay. And second one is explainability as well. So usually um, um, less complex model, uh, sorry, less, less complex model will bring to more explainability. So sometimes explainability is more important than a complex model like neural network itself, right? For example, regressions can be, can be represented in a parametric way, right? So, and model evaluations also very, very important. You need to understand what uh, you evaluate on regressions, classifications. You need to talk about complexity and explainability and such. And of course, eager and lazy learners. Um, yeah, for example, KN is um, um, is a lazy learner. Uh, sorry, eager learner. So every time that you every time that you put in like one distance value, then after that you will you will learn, right? You will you will actually just um, Oh, sorry, it's a lazy learner because like every time you put in values, then it doesn't learn, right? It just like, okay, it just like come and then I, I, I figure out where to put you. Whereas for regressions and most of like models like uh, decision tree, they will usually have a certain uh, rules to be placed so that when new data sets come in, then they will like need, need to relearn everything again, right? So those are the learner. Okay, then we have uh, ML ops and ML ecosystem. So by the end of the day, um, if you don't, if you don't uh, pay attention to ML ops, whatever you learned just now is actually quite useless, right? Because think about it, right? Uh, for Gojek, for example, or maybe like Grab, um, the kind of patterns that they have before and after pandemic would be very, very different, right? Currently, um, Grab always have like uh, the the like traffic kind of like distributions. So maybe like in the evening, like after work hours, then a lot of like fleets in, in the office area, CBD area, but then not so much in other places, right? But then after the pandemic, then this model will become like very outdated and then they need to redo again, right? And basically ML ops, right? Is like to combine DevOps in a machine learning perspective in which that you can do model push 
model validations and monitoring anomaly detections automatically. Okay. So again, um, this is the Netflix. And of course, the end goal of ML values um, is that you don't actually realize that it exists, right? If you don't know like whether your ML is performing good or not, most of the times it's because that um, you need to make it like a very seamless, right? You need to make it like, it's like, like you never know it's there. For example, I don't know that you know about this, but I think it will help you in your assignments a lot. In Google Slides, right, you can actually go through the auto draw here. So I, I do this a lot whenever I just want to um, draw a certain diagram or just like add on an icon. So for example, I just draw a house here, right? And then there's a window here, right? And then if you see here, auto draw shapes, right? There are so many houses already, right? So I just take the one that's uh, quite cool, right? And by the end of the day, you realize that, hey, it's there, right? Oops, not supposed to put a line there. Yeah, you realize that, hey, it's there. Like, it's making me a certain draw, right? So without you realizing it, right, it's actually just using ML, right? And auto draw is one of them. So the ideal case of ML is that it's very successful if no one saw, like, talking much about it. <laughs> Because like it's just working perfectly fine. Like when you use like Google, for example, right? You type in the search engine and it does autocomplete. You don't really think much about it, right? And because you don't really think much about it, it's invisible to you. So you just like keep using it because like um, the user experience is like very, very good, right? So this is the purpose of ML Ops, right? It's making sure that it delivers it to you in a way that is valuable for your users, right? To the point that the users doesn't even know that whether this there's an ML involved or not. Okay. But actually, in the back end, there are so many things that happen, right? <laughs> if you see about it, it's data verifications, machine uh, resource management, analysis tools, serving infrastructures. Wow, there's so many, right? And, and there's even like this one chart, right? They sort of summarize whatever that we need to know about ML. Right, ML ops. But of course, if you know that DevOps, um, it's like half of the journey done for you. So of course, the very first one is data, right? Uh, data is very, very important. So um, you, you will do a bunch of ETL first, extract, transform, and load. You will have a bunch of like, um, uh, like cloud service, uh, big table. You can use like record formats uh, in TensorFlow, for example. It's like any different kind of sample sets, right? and uh, cloud hostings out there that uh, that host data repository. And after that, always you do sampling, you explore it, you can use like Colab or Jupyter Notebook, just uh, visualize whatever you want to visualize, right? And after that, you will clean up the data, you will do a, uh, you do a transformations of the data, feature engineering. Then there you go, right? Um, you train and test. Notice here that one thing that's added here is data versioning, right? So if you know Git, right? Um, Git is really, really good because it uh, fashion control your uh, code repository. But in this case, you actually will run data fashioning on your data itself, right? So you will have a bunch of replications of different data from different time sizes. And then you can you actually have fashion it right, so that you can roll out to a data that's, that maybe has the kind of like more representative uh, distributions that you want to have, right? So this is the benefit of ML Ops. It's actually use the versioning for everything you do, including the data. Okay. Then of course, the second one is ML model. So ML model engineering, model evaluations, and model packaging, it's all there, right? So by the end of the day, um, it will make sure that, that every time you want to rerun with a new set of data, it will just run everything, right? It will run hyperparameter tuning. It will run like feature engineering and so on. Imagine like now we have like auto ML, right? Auto ML is like you put in your data and everything will be sort of like handled for you, right? And then you can just push it by using like server matrix, right? So this is quite similar, like in the sense that you don't actually, if you like combine it with sort of like auto ML account perspective, this will be automated for you, right? But if not, then you can actually create on yourself. You can run a crash and cross tuning or whatever you want to do, and you can push it all the same. 
And by the end of the day, um, this is what people usually forget whenever they talk about ML, is that DevOps is really, really important in ML, sorry. And that's sort of like what I uh, specialize in. I, I used to be a software engineer at FISA, and I work with a lot of with, uh, cloud hosting, right? And whenever we talk about cloud hosting, we talk about Kubernetes, we talk about Dockers, we talk about whatever like, uh, containers, right? That we can solve like this out and dish in like a uh, broken, broken service and repository. So DevOps really help you out. And it's actually the, the, the sort of like the glue codes to everything, right? The glue uh, processes of everything. So of course, uh, code versioning is there, a uh, very important model versioning, right? So you have data, model and code versioning. Then you go through the build and integration testing with CI CD. We all know about this continuous integration, continuous development, right? And, and continuous push, right? So it's always there. And after that, you go to monitoring login. And of course, there's always new feedback, right? Uh, it, it will add on to the data and you will check again if the distributions is still the same or not. And of course, everything is data version. So you can take a look at the flow of the data version and then see what are the differences into distributions. Okay, so by the end of the day, MLOps is data plus ML model plus DevOps. Okay, somebody asked uh, about like learning into DevOps. Okay, so I'm going to explain to this more, like uh, I think by the end of the presentation. So hold on to that. <laughs> yeah. Yep, so MLOps is data, ML model, and DevOps. And <laughs> And each of the sector is honestly is uh, is worth like different course, right? So imagine like data engineering pipeline is one course at NUS, uh, training is one course at NUS. So within this, you see that there are like nine courses already, right? And there might be like different courses for like different um like different processes, right? And of course that is outside compliance as well, right? We never talk about security testing. We never talk about uh, for example, privacy and social engineering protections, right? We never talk about threat handling. Um, yeah, so this is a part that MLOps is trying to solve as well, right? And of course, when you try to break down like each one of these, right? This is going to be very, very complex because now you talk about multiple a lot of tools like inside and outside Google uh, repository. But of course, uh, like all great tools and all great problems, usually we have like very smart people that work on it. And therefore you have something called TensorFlow Extended. And what it does is that it does the whole MLOps processes on top of like TensorFlow process or maybe other different model process. Okay. So oh yeah, any questions so far regarding, uh, regarding the MLOps? before we move on to a little bit of detail. Okay, going once, going twice, going three. Cool, thanks a lot. Okay, so, um, right, so this is TensorFlow Extended. And very simple put, TensorFlow Extended, uh, there are two main components, uh, three main components here that you can take a look. The first one is metadata store, and the second one is the component. And of, of course, the third one is the, the flow, right? It's the, if you know, directed acrylic graph, DAG. So you know that it's, it's a DAG format, right? Meaning that there's no like uh, sort of like feedback loops. There's no like going back. It's always like one direction throughout. Like university courses, right? It's always one direction throughout. Okay, and in here, you can take a look a bunch of like components that talk about data, right? So for example, we have training and evaluation data using um, whatever format that you have, like big table or uh, record format. And after that, um, you, you push it into the statistic gen, right? So the statistic gen essentially does the, is sanity, uh, the sanity testing, right? To make sure that the distribution is okay. If the distribution is not okay, then something's wrong. Hey, there's an anomaly detections, uh, or maybe there's a there's a drift, conceptual drift that comes in, right? So you need to solve every run again. Uh, it will alert you that uh, there's there needs to be more rerun because the data distribution changes, right? And imagine if like the pandemic happens during this time, it will actually will alert you like before um, you can do it like manually. It will alert you that hey, suddenly there's a uh, 
differences in the data distributions, are you sure you still want to go through with this model, right? If not, then you will lose a lot of money because obviously you are, uh, you are having a model that is based on a different axiom, right? So this is very, very important. And of course, um, uh, schema gen is there as well. So schema gen is basically understanding whether the schema is correct or not. For example, if let's say it's supposed to be categorical, uh, but or maybe like categorical with uh, enumerations, right? Uh, but then apparently there is like different uh, gender. I know that there is a system before that uh, they have like gender, like a uh, gender kind of uh, variable. So male and female, right? But then suddenly the upstreams workflow introduce like many different kinds of labels, right? So not only male and female, but also maybe like non-binary uh, kind of genders. So it will actually ruin your model because if your model is based on a schema that gender has is only like male or female, then it will stop working, right? So this is what schema gen does. It makes sure that um, it detects all of these like uh, anomalies in the schema before it runs to the uh, subsequent flow. And of course, you have the ML parts, transform, train, evaluate, right? Transform, train, evaluate. Okay. And after that, you have the model validator as well. So model validator is considered ML. Yep. So model validator, what it does, this is also very, very important, is that it makes sure that whatever model that you train or automatically training, it is better than the previous uh, version of model. Remember here that MLOps is about versioning, right? There's a data version, code versions, and even uh, model versions, right? And imagine that if you just run a CI CD without even looking at whether this model is performing better or not, then what happens is that um, in Amazon terms, that you will lose a bunch of billions of dollars, right? You might uh, suggest like price that's too, too cheap and everyone's sort of like uh, buying it. And, and since like Amazon is automatic, it's actually sending a bunch of these uh, products. So that happens, I think last, um, some Black Mondays or Black Fridays sales a couple of years ago, and Amazon lost a lot of money. So model validator, make sure that every model that you, uh, you created is always like properly fashioned and it's always like better than the, uh, the previous versions. Okay. And finally, uh, is like, of course, we, we want it to like push automatically. So we have like pusher, uh, TensorFlow Hub, TensorFlow.js, uh, TensorFlow Lite, TensorFlow Serving. So all of those talks about different optimizations of the model, right? For example, imagine that you run a very complex model, very complex like computer visions and uh, NMP model in the desktop. It, it works perfectly fine, right? Uh, because like, it trains on the desktop. But imagine if it trains on top of your mobile data and it kills your battery after half an hour. Then of course, what you would do is that you will complain to us, right? Like, what the heck, after I'm using this model, then suddenly my phone died because it's training, um, it's training like crazy on the phone. So having a multiple channels of these um, pushes and then compare it with the devices, right? That you are, you are looking into, for example, like Android, uh, how you handle models in Android compared to how you handle models in Chrome might be very, very different, right? So you need to understand all of these uh, different versions and different needs of uh, different media that you're using, okay? And of course, by the end of the day, we have metadata store audit. So this is uh, one of the big components of all the ML ops. And I think MLflow also use quite similar kind of terminologies is that it makes sure that all of these nodes and directed graph here, right, is all properly versioned, right? It's all properly audited. So let's say that I'm, uh, there's an automated runs that come here. Okay, it, uh, it sort of like looks into the data. It pulls the data, it looks into the data, it looks into the schema, and then it transforms. And after that, during the train, hey, suddenly uh, something breaks down and then the train fails, right? So would you like to do the whole process again? Example, statistics, schema, transform, and trainer? Probably not, right? Because imagine that you, you deal with like billions uh, kind of like scale of the data that Google and Facebook have, uh, terabytes. And of course, if you train a model about it, you want to make sure everything is properly versioned and everything is properly monitored. And you don't want to redo the whole thing over again, right? It was 
you will um, you will just waste your time, right? So the metadata store audit is actually taking the snapshots of each of these uh, uh, model process. So that rather than going through the whole things again, you can just like resume from the from the output of this uh, transform, and then you run it. Um, you run it, and then you will move on to the subsequent process, right? So this is what the metadata store audit does. Uh, there are also many other different functions, but I think this is this one is uh, one of the most interesting ones. So this is the last slide. Uh, after that, I will open up to the question and answer. Is that by the end of the day, MLOps and TensorFlow Extended is like Star Trek, right? So imagine like Captain Spock. Um, let's say that it uh, there's a meteorite that comes in, and then like everyone sort of like slowly, slowly like communicate to each other. Like, okay, tell me about the uh, tell me about the situation. The monitor, and then the monitor says that, hey, I think you need to talk to him. I think we need to run it. No one's shouting, but everyone's sort of like passing letter to each other. Well, nothing gets done, right? Um, nothing gets done if there is no like this fast information transfer, right? So the second one, right? So what a transfer standard does is that everyone knows each other's status at the same time, right? So if you want to like start from in the middle, it's up to you. If you want to start from the past, it's really up to you as well. And of course, there's a dedicated workforce. It's all in directed accurate graph. Every component has like different concerns. So it's, it allows you to collaborate uh, much, much easier. And finally, proactive reaction to feedback. So it handles like proactive reactions to concept three. Most of the times in universities, when we create a model for our project, or maybe for Kego, right? We just like forget about it, right? It, it, it won us competitions, it's perfectly fine. Uh, okay, let's forget about it, but it's not running in productions. But whenever you run in productions, you want it to be maintainable, you want it to be robust, right? So having an ML ops is actually making sure that it's robust, it's properly monitored and maintained. Okay, dedicated workflows, uh, fast information transfer, and proactive reaction to feedback, right? So to that, you will be able to work and run your own subtrack. Okay, so that's all, and probably a little bit of shameless marketing is that I actually um, create some articles regarding about what I do as a data scientist and also machine learning engineer at Google. So feel free to take a look into some of these. So these are articles that are related to ML ops, but yeah. If you want to find it, just Google about my name, Vincent Tatan, and you can type medium, or if not, you should be able to find it in uh, one of my top searches. Okay. And finally, um, reach out to me. I'm always like open to ideas, suggestions of how I can improve my presentations. And I hope this is engaging for you guys as well. Um, so reach out to me on medium, reach out to me on LinkedIn, and I'll try my best to um, to cater to you guys as well. And if you need a referral, feel free to let me know as well. <laughs> we'll be happy to talk to you more about it. Cool. Right. I saw there are some questions, but is there any questions that are on the spot, on the stage? You can feel free to unmute yourself. OK. If not, then um, I'll just take into the, okay, I'll just take into the from the chat then. Okay, so uh, the very first one, um, uh, how do we get into learning about DevOps? Seems very far into the development pipeline to easily get into with pet projects. Okay, um, yeah, this is very, very tricky. Um, regarding the DevOps is actually something that um, that's very popular, but it's not sexy, right? It's not as sexy as like artificial intelligence or uh, or maybe I'm assuming things. Of course, there are a bunch of like uh, books that are catered to DevOps. For example, uh, there's a book that I always read and it's really, really interesting. It's a DevOps, but they represent it in a novel. It's called the Phoenix and Unicorn Project. So the Phoenix Project and the Unicorn Project. So you want to understand to how you can learn about DevOps. It's always very, very important to think about why DevOps is there in the first place, right? 
And of course, historically, everyone is happy with uh, waterfall, uh, waterfall kind of programming methodology, right? Uh, code requirements is at the top, then after development, testing at the bottom, and everyone's kind of like working in a silo, right? And possibly when you're doing deployment, it's not like you're doing deployment in Android, right? You in Android, you might deploy like every week or every day or even every hour, right? But but in the past, during the mainframe and when uh, doing, there's not much like, personalized computing, no one uh, is deploying hourly, right? Everyone's sort of like, deploying by like, uh, half year basis, right? So waterfall pipeline. But of course, it doesn't scale well, especially with the evolving uh, computations uh, sort of like power and that we have now. And also, also like the people are getting more and more impatient, right? Like imagine like uh, if you order a cab and then uh, with a call and then like there's always like back and from back and form. It's like you, you will not take it, right? You will just use a grab. You just click in two clicks and after that you get your you get your taxi on cab, right? So DevOps is trying to go through with the process of how you can iterate the waterfall the waterfall more, right? And of course, how you think about the processes of supports, for example, like bug escalation handling, or for example, like uh, a jaw kind of methodology, which is a sort of like a part of the DevOps. So, so that's how you learn about DevOps, by knowing why DevOps come there in the first place and how you can add on into it. So Phoenix Project and uh, Unicorn Project is a very good book. And, and you, will, you will learn about DevOps a lot. The second one is uh, for ML ops. Do companies accept applicants with DevOps only or data engineering only experience? Or are you expected to come with generalist uh, background in all three, data model DevOps? This is very, very um, great questions. Um, okay, so the understanding of this is that it's always like it depends. All the answers always start with it depends, right? For my case, yeah, uh, honestly, I get into Google, I'm doing machine learning uh, engineering, it's partly because like, I'm quite generalist. I know um, I know software engineering more than data analytics, but at the same time, I also blog about data science. Right? Um, I blog about uh, in Medium when I when I work at FISA, right? which is my, my first job, right? So I blog on there and, and just like try to learn whatever that I can learn. And I sort of like try to, push whatever thoughts that I have, right? So for example, when I first started working, right? I always think about, hey, uh, where, where should I put my money, right? And of course, if I put my money in bank, then inflation comes in, and it's not ultra secure as well, right? So I'm thinking about, okay, let's invest it, right? But of course, when you talk about investing, then you talk about where should I start, right? Which stocks should I invest? So of course, uh, with that simple like problems and methodology, I sort of like, Talk with a bunch of like business friends from SMU, and I created solutions to them using web scraping and um, and a very simple like fundamental analysis kind of uh, data analytics, right? So based on that, it sort of like increases. Uh, you 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 have to have like end to end kind of like mentality, right? You have an audience, you have a problem in mind, and then you have like sort of data collections. You do web scraping or whatever you have. And then after that, it goes on to the maybe the analysis part, is data visualization parts, right? And making sure that it's communicated to the products, uh, the products audiences and users, and and you will have the kind of mindsets of like having all these three uh, kinds of um, data model and DevOps kind of perspective, right? Because by the end of the day, if you want to build a solutions, right, for a person that really really using it, then you need to push it, right? You need to push it, you need to test it, you need to make sure that it's uh, giving you a production or product, productionizable kind of uh, um, answers, right? And it's maintained throughout different time, right? Imagine how to do that. It, it's very hard with DevOps only, but imagine you do that with MLOps with the data as well. You need to do DevOps on your code, but you also need to do versioning on your data. It's, it's very, very tough. So you need to have an like end-to-end uh, kind of mindset and just think about how you can build value to your audience. So that's that's actually uh, what, what I recommend if you want to learn about MLOps. Okay, so how does MLOps recruiting differ in companies of not yet FANG scale, say Uber, Stripe, or even smaller? 
Okay. Uh, first of all, Uber and Stripe is not small company. <laughs> they, they are very uh, legitimate uh, technology companies, right? So in that, if that's the case, the kind of methodology that they have most likely will be quite similar to what Gojek, Grab, uh, Google, and um, and Facebook have, right? Fan companies. So if that's the case, usually um, I, I did like interview at Gojek before, and Gojek is sort of like the Uber kind of like um, Uber kind of equivalent in Southeast Asia, right? Like Grab as well. So their 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 interviews, I have to say, is actually very very tough as well, right? It's a data science interview, and and they ask me a lot about like uh, not only not only coming up with a model, right, but also how to present it, how to make sure that we have a data pipeline from the start until the end, how you are going to push it, how you're going to make sure that, of course, like when the, the pandemic happens. The model still runs, right? The model still runs and it's not losing the company billions of dollars, right? So that's that's basically what most of the uh, fan companies will ask, right? Like, what are your end-to-end -end thoughts? And not just within the, you have clean data, like in Kaggle, you have clean data and on that, you get, um, you get, you try to compete, optimize your score and win if you are more than, uh, if you have better metrics than the others, right? No, it's not like that. Usually in fan companies, they will ask you more about end-to-end -end approaches, right? So that's actually from my experience. Maybe it's different from other startups, but uh, in my opinion, yeah, it is, it is usually like that. Okay, then Andrew also asked, yeah, any good questions on uh, like this? I, I hope I'm actually, no, I hope I pronounce your name correctly. And Andrew also asked really on David's questions, how relevant is the Enron corpus in most more recent research? Okay, so um, honestly, web abuse is huge. And even though that I'm working on three different kind of products, for example, like Chrome, um, Android, and Gmail, uh, the kind of like corpuses that you are mentioning here is only like one part of it, right? It's, Maybe you can do a topic modeling on top of it, or you can do like a bunch of like NLP and then do a spam on HAM uh, with, with like fraud detections, right? You can do something like that, but uh, this is completely different from the use case that I have. My use case is that there are a lot of like blocks out there for the by blocks and sites. Uh, maybe like one day you will have like billions of sites, right? Because nowadays, if you want to host a certain content online, it just takes a few minutes, right? Imagine like Google Forms, right? You can actually um, you can actually type whatever you want. You can use like uh, many different kinds of tools as well. You can type whatever you want, right? So, so the idea that I'm building here is more towards how can we protect our users against people that are building uh, malicious content with malicious intention, right? So, of course, uh, having the end-on kind of purpose uh, might be might be good as well to be talking about this, but I don't know much about it. Maybe my colleagues will know more about this, but yeah, for this one, I don't know. I cannot say much about it. Okay. And great sharing, Tatan. I love the unicorn products as well. My question is, what do you think about the need for grad school to get into a machine learning related role in a bigger company? What are the op costs associated with it? Um, okay, grad school and machine learning. Okay, um, so the understanding about this is that what is the added value of uh, having a grad school, right? And currently, um, the big fan companies, at the very least, um, they they sort of like it's good to always like have like credentials, but it's not everything, right? You'll find a bunch of blog out there that talks about this. And there are so many initiatives that even like um, currently non-bachelor graduates can also apply for fan companies, right? There are so many certificates that sort of like promise that, right? So, so of course, regarding the grad school, it's, um, it's good to have, but it's not everything if you want to apply for a uh, machine learning related one. What are the op costs associated with it? Yeah, the op costs associated with it, of course, that differ over the time. Uh, I think by the end of the day, it's, it's always an economics point of view, signaling problem. And signaling actually works if you are sort of like having a special credential. 
like the purple cow, right? Um, there's another book by purple cow, for example. Um, and what happens is that if you sort of like differentiate yourself that you're different from others, right? In the sense that you have masters, but the rest don't have masters, then of course you will have a very nice signal that says that you are capable, right? But of course, during the pandemic, people are thinking about having a master's. Right? Uh, people are thinking, hey, maybe I shouldn't work um, nine to five quickly. Maybe I should just take master's first, uh, enjoy it as much as I can with the uh, education, right? And maybe I have an edge, right? So, so think about if everyone sort of has a similar mindset and does the same thing, and everyone has master's degree, then of course, um, it's not much worth it, right? But of course, um, you need to think in a sense of uh, what you are trying to achieve in master degree and what you need to be involved in. In a fan company, maybe it might not be much, but if you want to become an educator in the, uh, in the future, if you want to become a lecturer, for example, then having a PhD and master degree is usually a requirement, right? So think about it, like what you want to do and decide whether you want to take a master degree or not. Okay, so I think I'll answer two more questions, then after that we can close these presentations uh, for the sake of time. Okay. So Shikai asks other cases, um, other cases where scammers use ML to offer your spine filter, how to do win this cat and mouse game. Okay. Um, yeah, this this is tricky and obviously I cannot share much about it. Uh, but there, there, there are, right? In fact, if you, there are many different kinds of machine learning methodology that sort of like uses similar mindset, right? If you know about GAN, like generative adversarial networks, it actually, it's actually using like two different models that pit against each other, right? Generative and then adversarial, right? And then it's kind of pit each, each other trying to get ahead of the uh, arms war, right? So, yep, that happened a lot in fraud and abuse. Um, in fact, this is uh this is the fun part about it because like if your enemies sort of like your opponents is doing very very well then most of the times you also need to be very very well right and it's like a lot of new stuff that happening every day is different and this is the kind of mentality that you have when you talk about dota um for example like now there's a dota ai i can't remember what's the name suddenly but there's a there's a deep mind like dota bots right that's sort of like while every Dota player, right? And suddenly all Dota players follow the kind of techniques that this um, uh, Dota AI sort of like push through and everyone improve because of that, right? So in the sense that, yep, it is definitely going to be cat and mouse game, but um, this is actually the exciting parts, right? Because uh, sadly to say that there are some victims definitely because of these spams and abuses, but then at the same time, um, I, I have to say that um, it, it pushes a lot of innovations because um, these kinds, of, this kinds of fraud and abuses, especially in the middle of like pandemic where everything's going digital, right? Uh, imagine like all the brick and mortar businesses are already going digital. Um, this kinds of area is, is always going to be ultra evolving and always needs uh, more and more people to help out. Right, so, so that's the scammers and upper spine of the. Do you deal with data other than spam filtering in your work? Not sure what um, what's the focus here. Uh, would you like to clarify, uh, Owen? Okay, if not, then it's fine. Uh, do you deal with data other than spam filters? So allow me to use a bit of assumptions to understand the intention behind this. Um, okay, so spam filtering. Uh, yeah, spam filtering is a spam or ham, right? Uh, basically, uh, for me, is that we try to filter like phishing sites. Oh, okay, so as in spam filtering seems like a nearly soft issue and quite limited for an entire raw dev team to work on. Okay, whether this is really nearly soft issues is, is definitely not. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, for a very simple reasons is because that whenever there's a chance to make money, usually people will uh, flock to it, right? Um, and this kind of like phishing attacks on shell engineering and 
uh, different kind of spam and abuses. People actually try to game the systems. Why? It's because there are incentives, right? There are economic incentives to it, right? And if you do it correctly, um, a lot of people will, will actually innovate a lot into this, right? So, so nowadays we see a bunch of like uh, techniques that actually come uh, from security sites, from uh, web abuse sites. We see a bunch of like evolutions inside the, uh, the kinds of like features that we are using because it's getting more and more sophisticated and they can use many different kinds of media imaging more, right? Nowadays, uh, think about like what applications that you open in a day. You use WhatsApp, you use Facebook, you use Instagram, you use uh, Google, you use, uh, you use maybe like SG Bus or I'm not sure like what you use, right? But imagine all these applications are there, right? And of course, so many different kinds of medias, they have a like, different kind of metadata structures, they have different kinds of API, they have different kinds of like handshake that happens throughout like um, assumptions that behind each of these applications. And of course, if we want to sort of like make, uh, the, the mission of Google is always to make uh, information available, secure, available and easy to access, right? And if you want to make sure that we talk about all information and all data, then at the same time, we also need to take a look into all of these like different channels, right? And of course, the complexity actually getting higher and higher rather than getting lower and lower. Yeah, so I think that's all. I'm, I know I'm running out of time. Um, maybe Mayang uh, or Jingyan, is there any words? Uh, no, wow, that's a fair bit of questions, yeah. Uh, thanks to Vincent for answering all of them. So uh, yeah, it, in the interest of the time, it, if anyone, yeah, if anyone doesn't have, have or maybe if anyone really has any burning questions, uh, maybe Vincent, you can slash your contact info again so they can like, message you. Sorry, uh, Vincent? Um, sorry? Yeah, maybe you can share the slide with uh, your uh, contact information again so if anyone really oh. has any questions, they can reach out to you directly. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, so there's that. And with that, I guess we have, uh, okay, before I, I say we have come to the end of this Friday Hex, uh, uh, can I share my screen, Vincent? Yep, sure, feel free. Uh, let me stop my sharing. Cool. Uh, feel free to reach out to me, everyone. Um, I'll be try to be as responsible as possible at LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah so. Yeah, so. If you are a regular attendee of Friday Hacks, you know that we always ask for your feedback on uh, the talks that we have hosted. So please uh, do fill in this survey if possible and tell us what you would like to be interested, what talks you are interested, uh, who you are interested in hearing from. Uh, we'll do our best to host such talks. So really, uh, let us know, do, do the feedback, scan the QR code. And I'm gonna skip ahead for a little. So uh, for our next Friday Hack, uh, which is next week, actually, 19 March, we have a pretty special guest, uh, Yukiro Matsushi, Matsumoto, Matt, who is the creator of Ruby Programming Language. We'll be here to share on Ruby 3.0, which was, I think it was released uh, in Christmas last year. So he hasn't shared with us all the details of what he will be talking about, but I'm looking forward to it. So if you're interested, definitely join us next week. And also we have Ben Greenberg from Vonage who will be sharing uh, Ruby and sentiment analysis as well. So it's quite a Ruby theme talk. And yeah, join us if you're interested. And so uh, I'll leave it at the feedback form for a little longer. But yeah, we have come to the end of this week's Friday hack. So um, thanks everyone for attending. And thanks to uh, Vincent for giving, sharing with us. And uh, we'll update you with the recordings and whatnot uh, soon. And also, we promise you a little coffee. So uh, I'll get back to you on that. Yeah, right. thank you, everyone. Yep. Thank you, Jingyan and Mayang for uh, organizing this. And thank you, everyone. Really glad to be here in Friday Hacks. 
hopefully I can see you in person soon. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. That, that would be great, actually. <laughs> yeah, invite me again. I'll be glad to. And if you need more speakers, let me know. Uh, I think I have a bunch of like Google speakers like really, really love to share. Oh, definitely. Thank you. Okay, I'll uh, excuse myself. So thank you everyone for um uh, yeah for listening. See you around. Yeah. See you around, see you around yeah. in Singapore. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, so I'll leave the QR code up for maybe two more minutes and I'll end this uh, call. So once again, thanks everyone who's still left here for attending. Okay, I'll be ending the Zoom session now. Yeah, see you, see you around next week for Ruby 3.0 and sentiment analysis, everyone.